Good morning. Uh, I'm James Turnbull. I'm the CTO at Empatico. We build educational software for elementary school students. And before that, I was the Kickstarter and Puppet and Docket, Docker. So if you use Puppet or Docker, I'm partly responsible for some of that, and I'm terribly sorry. Um, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, I, I, I think the, the Datadog team have done an amazing job of putting this together. Uh, I, I remember sort of the early days of a few, few people in the office and piles of stuff everywhere. I'm also really excited because uh, Croatia broke, beat England last night, which always makes, a, always makes an Australian very happy when anyone beats England at sport, even if it's not us. Um, but this morning, uh, let's see, here we go. I appear not to be clicking, so there we go. All right, cool. This morning, I want to tell you a bit of a story. So uh, this story is a bit about where I come from in the monitoring world, a bit about, about the history of monitoring, and a little bit of a call to action about observability. And for many of you, uh, some of the story I'm going to tell you is, is uh, it, it's, it's, it's history, it's a place you've been. But for others, and particularly people outside of this room, it's a journey they're still going through. So uh, in the start of my career, uh, I was a data center operator, and that's a, a very long time ago, which is why I have no hair and gray in my beard. Um, I've managed to keep it off my neck, though, so and I, I still don't run Gen 2. But um, uh, back in the day, I was a shift operator, and uh, I worked with four or five other folks in a data center for a colo site, and uh, we managed about 40 mainframes. And our monitoring system was largely us. Uh, it was a human-based monitoring system, and we worked with checklists and runbooks. And some of you may be old enough to remember checklists and runbooks, but we would start a shift with ticking off items. You know, this bit of production is run, this, print, this job's run, this backup's done. And that was the check system, literally manual paper-based checks. And with 40 mainframes and, and, you know, four or five operators a shift, that scaled pretty well. But the world changed significantly. And in the next few jobs I had, client server appeared, and we started to see a significant increase in the of scalability, of scale and complexity in the applications we ran. And the second thing happened was that uh, back in the day, some of you may, not, may actually not remember this at all, but back in the day, IT wasn't necessarily a critical component in a business. Uh, but very quickly, it became apparent that things like email, uh, payment systems, IVRs, that six companies couldn't function without them. And as a result, IT became a mandatory requirement. So, needless to say, additional complexity, uh, additional scale, and high impact, things started to go wrong. And as around this time, we started to see uh, a significant increase in the number of outages, and the complexity of those outages, and the time it took to recover. And what emerged out of this was what I would describe as check-based monitoring. And uh, some of you will recognize the Saint reference in there, but Nagios is obviously the classic example of this, uh, and sadly remains the classic example. Um, but those of you familiar, check-based monitoring is periodic checking, like once every t 1, 10, 30, uh, 60 seconds of state. Essentially, either a binary, it's working or it's not working, or some kind of threshold. But this kind of monitoring is pretty fragile. And most of you in this room are familiar with the, the fragility of it, and uh, a lot of you will have probably moved on to the next generation. But a significant number of our peers in, in our community are, are still stuck in this place. And I'm going to quickly step through uh, what I perceive as, as, I guess, the problems. So limited resolution and scale. Um, if you would like to pick a fight with me later about whether Nagios scales or not, you are most welcome to. I'll happily block you on Twitter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but largely speaking, if you want to scale most check-based monitoring systems, you are building a distributed system with its own inherent problems and things. And if you are spending more time maintaining a monitoring distributed system than you are your actual distributed system, you have a big problem. Uh, it also has limited resolution, limited granularity. So from the perspective of, of uh, a check, you know, a lot can happen in the period of time between a check, particularly if you have to extend that period of time out to, to handle that sort of scale. Uh, it's particularly hard to hit things, things like trends. If something happens in seconds 0 to 29, but not second 30 when the check happens, you don't see it. Almost all check-based monitoring was originally reactive. And it was reactive in two different ways. Uh, one was it was often implemented after the application went to production, which is not awesome. Um, or it was implemented organically when something went wrong. Oh, something is broken. We should write a check for that. As a result, everybody's uh, monitoring system is both the same and weirdly unique in ways that you really don't want to have memories of. 
Um, almost all check-based monitoring, uh, because of where we came from, most people uh, originally built those systems were operations and infrastructure people. It's very infrastructure-centric, and it's very single data source-centric. So by that I mean that, that it's, it's generally based on, on the, the outputs of that binary, it's working, it's not working, or the outputs of that threshold. Up until actually not that long ago, a significant number of check-based systems did not collect any performance data. In fact, some of them actively threw it away. <coughs> no, Gios. Um, and until sort of people, particularly the folks at Etsy, started talking about things like StatsD and Graphite, uh, th there was not a lot of metrics gathered, there was not a lot of data other than that binary state. And there's not a lot you can do with that binary state. And more importantly, uh, that infrastructure-centric nature of things meant that we were monitoring widgets and not outcomes. I remember that early in my career, I would have a conversation with business people and I would say the widget broke. And they're pretty smart folks, they can context shift and work out what you mean. But ultimately, they were like, well, I don't really care about widgets, I care about outcomes. Whereas, uh, if you're thinking about the world in a non-infrastructure-centric way, then you are thinking about things like the invoicing system failed. And by the way, that means that a bunch of our customers probably missed their last invoice, and we might get an influx of calls to the customer center. Um, those sort of stuff is actually useful information to pass on to a business person. The widget is broken is not useful information. So the world has uh, grown since then. Um, most of you are probably familiar with some of these things that we now, are, we now look after. Um, some of them for good and some of them for evil. Um, but the world has distinctly got not, not gotten simpler. And a second thing has happened to IT. Where previously IT was mandatory, it's now a business differentiator. Being better at product, being better at IT, being better at shipping product, having higher availability and better performance actually matters from a competition standpoint. There are organizations who have failed as organizations because their IT has failed. So, we've seen the world increase in complexity. Uh, we've seen the world increase in scale. Uh, those those client-server environments are now containers or serverless functions uh, or virtual machines or spin-on-demand cloud instances. Um, the impact has got a lot more significant. But largely speaking, uh, monitoring hasn't actually changed fundamentally. Um, there are a lot of people in this room who are probably looking at this and going, thank God I don't live in that world anymore. But outside of this room, uh, surveys, uh, talking to a bunch of folks, have indicated that for the vast majority of shops, the core of their monitoring system is still what I would describe as check-based monitoring with a variety of different tools, but something that resembles a Nagios-like thing at the center of it. Uh, and that's a pretty frightening thought given how things have changed outside of that world. And it, and it does disturb me that, that uh, the parts of our industry that have advanced really quickly uh, have not sort of allowed us to catch up a little bit. So we've established that, that maybe we haven't done so well uh, in the past. Um, and I think we need to think about what I would describe as a new start. And I think we need to think about that in two different ways. The first one is that uh, we need to think about what we're doing now. We need to think about evaluate our existing systems. We need to think about how they're built, what information we're collecting, what we're watching and what we're learning on. But more importantly, we need to think about a bunch of new requirements. So this is not just about patching old systems. This is about thinking about the world in a new way. And I've chosen the word observability. It's a little bit, I, I don't like definitions like this. I think this, this is very fluid at the moment. But currently, everyone's settled on the word observability, much like they've settled on DevOps, and I hope it doesn't end the same way. Um, but this is the sort of paradigm that I think that we, we, we need to be at. And some of you, would, this is something that a world you live in right now, but for others, uh, it isn't. So observability to me is an umbrella term. It embraces more than monitoring. It's not a perfect definition. Um, it, you know, I think it encompasses a bunch of different functions. I look at observability including things like monitoring and testing, um, uh, to some extent sort of process-based things, changes, uh, tracing, logging, all come underneath the, the observability banner. Um, and my call to action here really is that, that in order to get to this place, I'm going to talk a bit about what, how we get there, we also need to consider that as part of that journey, we need to be sharing that information. We need to be spreading that knowledge around to people. We need to be helping our peers uh, in the industry actually take a step forward and move into this new world. And there's two reasons I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of that. One, um, it's important to give back. Uh, I'm, I'm heavily involved in open source. I, uh, I, I write books. I, I try and, I try and uh, leave every readme I find slightly better than I, I, uh, I found it. Um, and the second reason is, at some point in time, you may end up working at one of these companies. 
And it's much more pleasant to go into a company that thinks about the world in a better, in a better way than it is to think, that think about in an existing, slightly backward, slightly uncomfortable way. So when I tell people uh, to think about the, the new world and how to communicate to that to people, I start with a, with a, a think about base requirements again. And the first base requirement I always tell people is it's not about the tools. You can choose whatever tool you like. Um, I think the Datadog team would love you to choose their product, and that's awesome. Uh, I think it's a pretty cool tool. Uh, but if you choose to sh choose anything you like, uh, the problem is, is, not a, is, is always when you start a solution with a tool. Like uh, the number of architectural conversations I've started with people where they go, we chose insert name of tool here, and now we're building our requirements. I'm like, well, okay, like what is actually the, what is, what is the logic of, of choosing the tool first? I read this blog post. Or this guy on Reddit uh, uh, said that this thing was really cool, um, and hence Mongo. Um, so this is not a great way of thinking about the world, and it's not a great way of building product. However, a good way to think about building product is to think about who the customer is. And, and in the observability world, the customer is no longer you. Your monitoring system still exists under there. It still does stuff. But it is no longer the, the, the realm of, of you being the pure customer of, of that system. The customer of your observability system is application developers, security people, DBAs, the business, and sometimes even external customers. So if you think about their business requirements, if you think about their needs as a first step, it's a great way to actually sort of rebuild a sort of view of the world. Because, sorry, I'm having a bit of trick clicker problems here. OK, cool. Because in my mind, observability concerns are actually business concerns. Observability is a business system. It happens to have technology underpinnings, but it's real, the real reason it exists is to provide feedback on the nature of your systems and the, and the nature of the systems that run your business. And so I always start with gathering requirements. Talk to the business, talk to application developers, and say, what do you care about? What do you measure? What are the things that you are accountable for? What happens you know, when something goes wrong? How do you measure that? What, what, what is the indicator there? And I build the set of requirements based on that. And I document the fact that all the things that I, I, I have to be able to produce metrics that these people can consume in such a way that makes it easier for their, them to understand what's happening and saves a step in that whole context shifting process. Also, as part of this, observe, observe, the observability world is proactive and not reactive which means that uh, for most of you, hopefully now you have transitioned so that monitoring systems are built as part of systems development, as part of building products. So you help application developers instrument things, you provide them with self-service tools that allow them to add applications and services or microservices or whatever to your monitoring environment without your involvement. Uh, you, talk to, you, uh, you provide uh, input and advice and architecture from day one, from when they start building the system. Monitoring is a first-class citizen in the design. You can't solve all of the problems. Your monitoring system will still evolve reactively. Things will still go wrong, particularly in a distributed systems world. But you can significantly reduce the, the blast radius, as people would describe it, or the impact of those problems by understanding how the system works and ensuring that the key inputs and outputs of that system, the business metrics that function in your organization, actually are addressed from day one, instead of you having to go back and do software archaeology on a bunch of code to find out what's happening. And well and truly are we past the day where uh, the cattle versus pets argument exists. It's done, right? Most of your components are disposable, well, whether that's a, a serverless function or a container. The number of things that in, in modern environments that are essentially fire and forget or essentially things that, that whose lifespan is significantly smaller than, than your traditional assets. So you need to focus on observing systems. Think about components as, as interchangeable. Stop thinking about the world in terms of CPU, memory, and disk, but think about the world in terms of this is a, pro, a system that runs a business process. I may need to be able to drill down into that system. I may need to still collect some of that data, but it's not the primary reason I monitor it. This also encourages people to monitor end to end. It really matters, the customer experience matters to our end users. You need to be looking at things as a whole system instead of the, the, just the components you manage. You're gonna have to use more data sources. The observability world is definitely one in which uh, you need to combine a bunch of information. And the basics of this are things like you, your monitoring system still exists, you still have checks. You're definitely gonna include metrics data. You need to think about logs 
uh, either, either adding logs as context, diagnostic context, or even counting log events to provide metric data. You need to think about traces. You need to think about uh, the metrics that come off your processes, your continuous integration, your testing. You need to think about your configuration management tools and the data they export. You need to think about the context uh, of around, around the data, the business uh, uh, telling you what these systems do and their components do. Because that rich data means deep context. Uh, if you are going to be dealing with complex systems, you need as much information as possible. And on day one, when you see a fault, you need to be collecting information that says, I detect latency has, has suffered on this particular system. OK, I know about this system. It belongs to these people over here. I can drill down into it. I can see its pieces. I can add that context to rich data. Tools, tell you, uh, tools give you data that tells you information. Data with context actually gives you answers. So to sort of finish up a little bit, uh, I look at the monitoring world as being, as being, it's still a cool thing, it's still tech we should work on, but it is merely a component of what we do as for a living. And it's a component that we need to look at uh, and, and reevaluate and refactor, but it's really a symptoms-based detection system. And we are no longer in a world where that is sufficient. Uh, we're now in a world where you need highly granular insights into the systems that you manage together with business context, together with understanding of service level objectives and SLAs and the needs of the business. And we, inside this observability world, it's about understanding. And my ask for you this morning is that publish that blog post, open source that code, share that information, tell that story, give a conference talk, help the rest of our community take that next step into a better place. Not only will, is it great for you professionally, but it's great for your organization and it's great for the community as a whole of monitoring people uh, and we can allow to say we can no longer, uh, we're no longer in a position where there are folks allowed to call it, say, monitoring sucks. We can actually live in Jason Dixon's wonderful world where monitoring is all about love and happiness and hugs. Uh, I'm, I'm not possibly there quite yet because I'm very cynical and Australian, but it is, important to, it is important to understand that this is a step forward we all need to take, and uh, I very much appreciate your time listening this morning, and thank you so much.